Good morning, everybody. My name is Tom Peterson. Um, I've been the person trying to put together a lot of this course. Um, obviously, it's been advancing thanks to the contributions of many, many instructors who've put tons of time into it. Uh, but I'm going to jump in and give you a talk today about uh, occurrence data. Essentially, we've We've come in through an introduction and some some theory and some discussions about um, data sources for environments, but now we're going to talk about data sources and data for characterizing the occurrences of species. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of an overview today, and then my uh, colleagues and I will give you several pieces of, of uh, wisdom about, about actually how do you obtain, improve, manage, and use occurrence data. So this will be kind of one of our, this will be our second really in-depth empirical section to this course. I'm going to switch to a presentation. Okay, so essentially what we what we want to talk about is just kind of in broad strokes, what are occurrence data for species that we're going to use in ecological niche modeling, and what should we do as far as obtaining them and using them appropriately. So let, let's jump into this. Now, what are, we, what are we really setting out to do? Well, we want to describe the distribution of our species with respect to environments and with, a, with respect to geography. Um, and so we have kind of a dual challenge, and I'm gonna illustrate that for you in a little while. We certainly wanna come up with data that describe the spatial distribution of individuals of the species. And Jorge Soberon will be talking a bit more about this later. Um, but that, this, is a, this is a tough goal to, to fulfill. Um, we usually talk about, oh, we want unbiased data, or we want random data. And we need to think about what those qualities mean. But most fundamentally, we want data that will allow us to develop ecological niche models without being biased or misled or, or tricked into uh, concluding wrong answers. So in this talk, I'm gonna use the Woodhouse's scrub jay as an example, the beautiful photograph that I, I stole from a web page from the, the Audubon Society. Um, this is a bird species that I studied in my doctoral dissertation uh, decades ago. Uh, but this is just, I could do this with any species on Earth, and it would have similar, but perhaps a different mix of problems, uh, as I'm going to show you with this species. So how do we describe the distribution of this species? Well, I, I know it's a Western North American thing. Um, if I go, as most of us do, to GBIF and put in a query, I get a global range map that looks like this, which is clearly um, abstracted a bit. And so these circles uh, represent numbers of records. And you can see that, well, we have more records in the north and and some records in farther south, uh, we have these kind of five or six odd concentrations. We're gonna think about that. We can zoom in and we see again those concentrations. And we can start to think about why we're seeing concentrations, especially why we're seeing concentrations where we're seeing them. We have parts of the world that are rather sparsely inhabited. We have parts of the world that are densely inhabited by people and by, most importantly, bird watchers. Uh, that's Salt Lake City. 
This is the front range of the Rockies with Denver and Boulder and things like that. And clearly where there are lots of bird watchers, there are also lots of bird records. So when we see a sparsely recorded region like that, we have to think very carefully about what it means and whether there's a biological meaning or whether it's a, a data reason and perhaps doesn't have much to do with the biology of the species. So we have all sorts of questions about these, these point data. Um, what do these concentrations mean? I just gave you one possible answer, but not the only possible answer. We see gaps and we wonder what those mean. And then we see some outliers. We ought to wonder about what those mean also. Now, one of the biggest features is clearly not biological. Um, if you look at this portion of the species range, you see a lot of records in the north and you see fewer records in the south. Now, no, this is not a biological effect of Trump's wall. But what this is, is it's an effect of um, density of bird watching, density of reporting of bird records, which is clearly greater north of the US-Mexico border than it is south. There are birders south of the border in Mexico, obviously, um, but they're less frequent and possibly less connected uh, to a, a network like eBird, uh, which contributes a lot of these records. And so this is what it is, but these are the data that we're gonna feed into our models. This is not criticizing anybody, this is just saying, these are the data we're going to put into our models. And what is this going to do to uh, the sorts of models that we want to develop? Will we get out the kinds of results or the quality of results that we need for the science we want to do? So another source of, of distributional information are gridded maps. This is a gridded map of the same set of data about about um, Aphalochoma woodhousei, woodhouse's scrub jay. We can also go and get range maps. Um, these are range maps that are developed by the IUCN and BirdLife International. Um, and what you can see is this nice range-wide summary. And you can see it appears to uh, tell us some information about where the species is present year round and also where it is scarce. Although my experience with this species would be that it's not scarce in those places, it's plenty common, just you have to be in the right habitat and that habitat isn't always the same as it is for this species farther north. Anyhow, what are these range maps? I mean, a lot of people, especially in the field of macroecology, a lot of people are using these as input data into analyses. Well, again, we come out with a bunch of questions. I expanded that map and I see all these things that, that I worry about. Um, for example, in this huge area, is that a continuous distributional area? Is the species literally actually or potentially present in every square meter of that area? And why do the ranges have these nice smooth lines, these nice smooth ends and borders? Um, I know from traveling there that this is a desert basin. Is the distribution of the species really continuous across desert regions like this or like the, the deserts in Nevada? And when we see a, an area like this, is that breeding range or low density breeding range, or maybe are these uh, non-breeding individuals? Well, these are all questions that are opaque to us when we try to use secondary data, such as 
uh, the IUCN bird life range maps. Um, I'll give you one example of, of that, um, or one example of the, the quality concerns about these maps. Um, this is an analysis that some colleagues in Mexico and I did a few years ago, where we showed the IUCN range maps, but then we also showed in a very carefully curated data set all of the outlier occurrences that are left out of the IUCN range maps. And in fact, what we showed was that with uh, increasing numbers of occurrence data, you still end up around 20 or 30 percent, let's say 20 percent omission rates, where the actual occurrences tend to fall outside of the range polygons that the IUCN um, and bird life are serving. So I personally would say just don't use these. Uh, this is secondary data. These are abstractions and they're clearly at a very, very coarse spatial resolution. And look at this straight line that, that extends across most of Mexico. Um, species ranges don't have limits like that, period. Okay, so let's talk about what we can then conclude uh, as regards range summaries, or essentially the data that we could obtain about geographic ranges. We can use polygons, we can use grids, or we can use points. Each one of these types of summaries has some pretty serious failings. Um, the polygons tend to be overly extensive, which is to say they include areas that are clearly not part of the species distribution, but they also exclude, and this is a more serious failing perhaps, they exclude real distributional areas. The grid information is basically just a an aggregation of the point information, and so it clouds or uh, degrades the data to spatial resolutions that, um, that are not as fine. The only primary data that we can get are points, which is to say points represent what I would call primary biodiversity data, which are data records that say this species was present at this place at this point in time. And so I'm going to suggest to you with very little flexibility in my opinion that um, we only should use primary data in developing our models. Um, I'm not going to go into this with illustrations or anything, but um, using things like minimum convex polygons or alpha hulls don't really do a very good job because species geographic distributions can often be very much like like swiss cheese you know with with holes in the in the interior um, and so much more useful as a way to summarize ranges of species we should be taking into account the environments that correspond to the points and we should use environmental signatures as a way of guiding our interpolations or our, our, our filling in what is likely presence and what is likely absence. And those, um, those interpolations guided by environments, that's what a niche model is. Okay, so that's essentially why we're doing this course. So what phenomena do we wish to represent? Well, this is, a, this is another consideration. I just put in a quick illustration of this. We might say, I want points for Aphylacoma woodhousei, but we really should be thinking about what about Aphylacoma woodhousei do we want to summarize? So here's an example. There are gridded data. And you remember I asked you about these outliers that seem to be out in the desert. Well, I was using year-round data to pro produce this grid, 
Now I'm going to overlay point data that are only from May and June when these birds are breeding. Okay, what I want you to see is that all of these deserty sites down in um, the Mojave Desert and the Sonoran Desert, those are all um, non-breeding birds. And indeed, for this species, uh, immature birds tend to wander a bit, um, especially kind of in the course of their first year. And so right away we can see, well, we ought to think about, are we attempting to develop a model of the breeding range or of the overall total year round range? Those make huge differences. And it also, they also make huge differences as far as what kinds of data we're going to use in our models. So the classic response to these concerns would be, well, let's use unbiased data or let's use random sampling. So I want you to think very carefully about the Hutchinsonian duality. You've heard about this for, in a lecture from Jorge Soberon already. Um, and this is a visualization that uh, I stole from, from Marlon Cobos, whom, who will be talking later in the course. But essentially what I want you to see is here's a map of the Americas, and here is a diagram showing the environments of the Americas. And what Marlon has is equal sized blocks, or more or less equal sized blocks. And you can see that they correspond to different areas of environmental space. That should be a bit clearer. And what you can see is that some of these blocks of geographic space correspond to really big areas in environmental space or really small areas. And so you have to be thinking constantly about both of these spaces. And so right away when I said random or unbiased, we have to think about in which space and what that will mean as far as characterizing the environmental distribution of our species, which has to do with the niche. So just as an exercise, I overlaid a set of uniform grids of points on the limits of Mexico. I'm not showing them here, but there's a um, 2.5 minute grid, a 10 minute grid, a one degree grid, a two degree grid, and a four degree grid. And what I want you to see very simply is that if this is all of the environments of Mexico, well, the coarser grids, which are shown by the yellow diamonds and the blue squares, the coarser grids only sample these environments and they leave more than half of the environmental range of the species, sorry, of the country, completely unsampled. They're completely left out of that uniform grid. Or I can, or I can uh, distribute my sampling uniformly in environmental space. So imagine just a grid of points covering this entire environmental range of Mexico. If I do that, I get geographic points that look like this, okay? And notice that we've left out major geographic regions of the country. So my only point here is you have to be very careful about saying, well, uniform or unbiased sampling or random sampling of what? because it maps onto what you're trying to estimate. So what is the ideal distribution of points in a, um, in a sampling scheme, which obviously would then map onto how we characterize the distribution of a species? Well, ecologists love random points because they sample this broader universe of places and conditions. But as I've just shown you, random points geographically or uniform points geographically can miss lots of environments. 
Random points in environmental space can miss big geographic regions. But I'm going to remind you that a niche model is attempting to characterize tolerance limits, tolerance limits with respect to environments. So we really need to organize and stratify and optimize our sampling of environmental space to every degree we can. And so for an ecological niche model, we probably need to seek points that are representative across environments and maybe we can accept some geographic non-randomness. We need to go even farther into this. We need to talk about absence data, which seems to be a different topic, but it isn't. You remember the BAM diagram, and you remember that our species should be present as far as permanent sustaining populations only in this kind of three-way intersection between the abiotic suitable areas, the biotic suitable areas, and the accessible areas. So let's look at this a little bit more in detail. That's where our presences are, right? That's where our species sustains populations. And those are where our absences are because those are outside of that region of, of kind of sustained suitability uh, where our species can, can establish populations. But really there are other absence areas. There are other places where we can get absence data. We've already talked about this, but these parts of the potential distribution are perfectly suitable in terms of environment. They're just outside of our accessibility circle. And those sites are essentially where species invasions happen. We can also get absences within the potential, within the accessible portion of the potential distribution of the species. Very simply, sometimes a species is not there, uh, maybe not detected. It may be a local uh, extirpation. It may be um, the place was, um, was uh, deforested, and for that reason, the species isn't there, which might have nothing to do with the, the set of dimensions in which you develop your niche model. But suffice it to say, even just because of metapopulation dynamics, you can have absences even in this area. And by that same token, you have presences all across the accessible area, okay, but, but they're not going to be sustained presences. So we have to think a lot about why our species is absent from a particular site. We need to ponder whether the data are sufficient to establish absence. And there's a whole different um, set of models that can that address this question of occupancy modeling, um, and that might be a, a very fruitful uh, way of, of using absence data, essentially developing occupancy models um, to establish which absence sites uh, are sufficiently well documented. But we need to think about that. And to be very honest, we need to think very carefully about you whether you even want to use the absence data in your models. You may be better off using presence data and some characterization of the background, but not trying to use those absence data. As a further illustration of this, uh, think about any given site, okay? And we want to know, is our species present there? So here's the BAM diagram shown as a probability tree. This is M. Did the species get there? Yes or no? This is B. When the species got to that site, so assuming a yes, were the right set of biotic interactors present? And this is A, where if the first two 
conditions were met, were the conditions suitable? And that can be yes or no. Now notice that you can have suitable or unsuitable sites that are on these parts of the tree, but they will always be absent. We'll never find our species outside of the accessible area or outside of the biotically suitable area. We can only make those comparisons that are relevant to abiotic suitability, which is to say developing a niche model. The only comparisons that are relevant are right here. And then there's a whole bunch of other considerations. Did a researcher ever visit the site? Yes or no. And when the visitor, when the researcher visited the site, was the species detected? Yes or no. Was the record reported? There's all sorts of sources of data leakage that lead to absences of a species from a site. But notice that the only place where we get a usable record is if all of these questions have been answered affirmatively. All the rest of these are absence data. And so we need to be very careful about how we use data. Presence data obviously are filtered by many different filters, but presence data do represent a presence of the species. Absence data could represent absence for many different reasons. And many of those don't have to do whether, most, many of those have, do not have to do with whether the species found the right set of conditions at that site. Okay, so to use absence data appropriately, definitely they have to be absence data from within the accessible area, M. Otherwise they are not appropriate for including in a niche modeling exercise. You need to consider the reasons for non-presence. Um, is the species not there because the species um, had access to the site but found that the conditions weren't suitable? Well, that's useful information in a niche model. But many other reasons would not be useful information in a niche model. You can use the absence data but if they're going to be the only negative contrast to the presence data when you calibrate a niche model, they also have to be comprehensive enough to define the limits of the tolerance of our species. So this is not an easy question about whether you use absence data or not, and other people will talk about that later in the course. And then I want to come back around to a, a a more practical consideration, and that's data quality. This is some years ago, but some colleagues and I um, did a query of available information um, for Lysina dispar, which is a common butterfly in Europe. And we queried the, the uh, Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF, and this is the set of data we got out. And you can see it's a very curious distribution. There are some things that we can notice immediately. For example, a lot of the French data, in fact, many European data, clearly look like they are very coarse. Maybe they were rescued or extracted as the centroids of atlas squares or some something, but regardless, they lost a lot of their precision. Have a huge gap in Germany. I'm not sure it's a real biological gap. And then we have incredible density in Poland. So I think we need to think very, very carefully about whether the quality of these data is high enough for us to be able to use these data. It's just a question. So we need to think about what are errors, which is to say, 
a precise record that places a given species at the wrong site, uh, a coarse, insufficiently precise record that may be too coarse with respect to the environmental data, that can be just as damaging. Um, certainly, sorry, certainly we, we know that there are biases in sampling both geography and environments. We tend to sample the slopes of mountains better than we sample the peaks. We tend to sample open forest better than closed forest, et cetera. I think a very clear uh, conclusion is that all biodiversity data sets include error. So what we should be doing is to set out to minimize the effects of those errors on the models we might develop. So essentially what we have to think about is, this is overall in developing models based on primary biodiversity data, Remember that we are striving to describe the distribution of the species in environmental space. Only point occurrence data are primary, and as such, only those data represent actual research grade data on the, the, the range of the species. We need to consider carefully what, are it, what it is that we're wishing to characterize and what sort of sampling would best represent that. We need to think about absence data. Essentially, do the blessings outweigh the curses? My own feeling is that very frequently um, the curses outweigh the blessings, and we should not use the absence data. But that is a point that's open to debate. And we need to assure that we have sufficient data quality that we can avoid rampant bias and the effects that that bias would have on resulting models. So in this section of this course, which is to say in coming weeks, uh, we're gonna hear lectures on the relation of occurrence data to theory, on sources of occurrence data, on georeferencing, which is a crucial way of enabling and, and uh, making available data. We're gonna hear lectures on data cleaning, on filtering with respect to autocorrelation and oversampling. We're gonna talk about subsetting data for evaluation. And we're also gonna talk about kind of responsible citation of data. So that's all that I'm going to talk with you about today. Um, this has been an overview and maybe it's been a bit of an esoteric overview, which is to say uh, the world according to me. Um, so any omissions or any uh, gaps or any overemphases, my apologies. What I'm trying to do is to give you kind of a, uh, a panorama that will allow you to think carefully about occurrence data and what they tell us and what they don't tell us and what we can uh, derive from them and what we shouldn't derive from them. So I hope this has been helpful. Uh, have a good week, everybody. <laughs>